Hi, Emil. I have started the presentation and the webcam web, webcast, so you can start. Hello, everybody. I'm sure there's many of our resellers here, also our customers and prospects. Today, Anthony will give us the second amazing webinar about I, amazing eye machining 3D. I hope most of you have watched his webinar last week about eye machining 2D. It was a, really a very eye-opening webinar about all the technical factors are behind eye machining. And I recommend to everybody who have missed that webinar to watch the recording. Today, we are talking about eye machining 3D. It's a really an amazing technology where you could, with one click, do all the machining of a prismatic part or a surface part. And you can save sometimes up to 90% of machining time to do the roughing and the semi-finish of your 3D part. It's a powerful technology and we would love every customer of SolidCam to have it. So Anthony, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Emma. And Emil, I think you can stop uh, sharing your webcam. Yep, great, thank you. Okay, so let's get started. All right, so first of all, thank, thanks everybody for joining. Um, I'm sure a lot of you joined in the first presentation that I did last week um, on iMachining 2D. This presentation is gonna go over some of the same stuff that I did then because iMachining 3D builds on iMachining 2D. So if I just jumped into only the 3D iMachining stuff and you didn't watch the first webinar, uh, you would obviously be missing the most important portions of iMachining. Um, and as Emil said, iMachining 3D is even a greater time savings than iMachining 2D. Um, and uh, I'm gonna go, go over why that actually happens. Um, so let's, uh, let's get started. And yeah, thanks everybody for joining again. So eye machining, unbelievable cycle time savings and unmatched tool life. And uh, as Emil said, normal eye machining 2D, our customers are seeing 70% savings or better. And with 3D eye machining, really the savings can be even higher. Um, and this is down to it replacing several tool paths with just one eye machining 3D tool path. So eye machining consists of two modules. First is the tool path generation and then the technology wizard. And the technology wizard is what calculates all of the cutting feeds and speeds and what we call cutting conditions for the tool path. So I'm gonna go over a couple of the time savings of, of real life examples, because when we talk about eye machining, the main thing we talk about is cycle time savings at the machine. That's really where um, the main the main difference is, even though eye machining makes the programming incredibly simple, in the end, we are trying to tell everybody about the savings on the machine. So here's a simple simple triangular pocket in titanium. Uh, this was cut at Gardner Aerospace in conjunction with this car. They use CATIA to program this just simple single pocket, You know, especially in, in aerospace, you have high volume um, titanium parts that are machined out of billet. So this one went from four, 14 minutes in CATIA to three and a half minutes in eye machining, which is pretty amazing. Eye machining savings in aluminum is also very large. And a lot of people think that with aluminum, hey, I'm already running the maximum of my machine. I'm running my big tools. I pretty much am hitting the horsepower limits of my machine. Even our customers that, that have tremendous optimizations with their aluminum cutting, they see huge savings. So here's just a simple, you know, 200 millimeter by 120 millimeter aluminum part. Um, this customer had 400 pieces to machine. Standard cutting time was 17 minutes. Eye machining took that down to six minutes. I think the biggest difference when we talk about cycle time savings is the cycle time total run. So for 400 pieces on this part, that's 73 hours of machining. So you can imagine this eye machining is like gaining extra CNCs in your machine shop. I mean, 73 hours of, you know, most people aren't gonna run 24 hours a day. So this is, this is like having a second machine set up cutting parts um, to get your parts out the door quicker. This is another 
small little bracket in, in titanium. Standard cutting time was 17 minutes. I machining took that down to three and a half minutes. Once again, for a 75 piece cycle, we have 16 hours of machining. So I machining 2D and 3D savings really gets um, quite large. And so here's like really a pris what we call a prismatic part. So this is, you know, this customer is machining housings and things like that. And basically they are, they're, they're prismatic in nature. More or less, there's just 2D features all around the entire part. Um, so this customer is seeing between 65 and 75% on all their parts. And they're using iMachining 3D to do roughing and then iMachining 2D for their, for their finishing. So here's a more, let's say, traditional 3D contoured part. Um, so this is this is a steel part. Most of these parts are probably going to be coming, you know, out of out of if you're doing molds, you're going to be cutting them out of steel, obviously. Um, so this part, the previous cycle time was 146 minutes. With eye machining, we knocked that down to 28 minutes. It's an 81% savings. It's it's amazing what eye machining 3D knocks off of your cycle times. Another main thing with eye machining is reduced CNC wear. And this is definitely something that is, you know, not something that a lot of people think about when they think about with CAM software, like what is the wear and tear on my CNC? But the eventually all things in your CNC wear, the spindles, the bearings, the linear, everything eventually wear. So what eye machining does is by having a constant load on the spindle at all times during the cutting, the load on the spindle, the bearings, the, the drives, everything is constant. Um, we generally see our customers running in the four to 17% spindle load, and it's constant. There's no spikes, there's no ramping up, there's no ramping down. Every time we hear tools squeal when they go into corners and chatter and those things, all that chatter and squealing is resonated not just through the tool, but through the entire machine. And that is slowly wearing away your machine. The more expensive the machine you buy, the more important, let's say this is. Um, so, you know, if you're going to, if you're investing, you know, 400,000 euro or, or more on a, on a fantastic high speed machining center with a, with a high speed RPM spindle, the wear and tear on the spindle, it's, it's, it's a big thing to consider. We've had Hermley and Makino both test eye machining on its machines um, against similar cam systems that say they do high-speed machining, and they've both concluded that our high-speed machining and i-machining is the lowest forces acting on the machine. So I have a 3D i-machining video to run, and since we are in GoToWebinar, what I do is I'm going to switch over to the video cutting. So give me one second here. Now, for everybody, this should have popped up a separate panel um, that says go to webinar viewer. And you can actually expand this because I think it kind of shows up about like one third or, or about one third of your screen. So you can take the little bar at the bottom and drag it even bigger. Here's iMachine 3D cutting this part. What you'll notice is just like with iMachine 3D, we always do these depth of cut. So you can see the first cut starting with a like And then afterwards, we go to our step up. This is the main thing that they do to keep it on a cycle time. So what you'll see is the tool is working backwards up the model, and it is doing scallop based cutting to what we call breast rough or semi-finish during the roughing season. So you're seeing the traditional line machine is pretty cool path, but now you're seeing it also doing the step up scallop, which is going and generally creates the overall shape of your of your part. I will switch back to my main screen.
okay, so how does iMachining cut and have a constant load on the machine the entire time? So there are two main things that iMachining does, which is variable cutting angle and variable feed. So what does variable feed mean? We use variable feed to keep a constant chip thickness. So what you'll notice in iMachining is when the tool is engaged at the smallest amount, we will increase the feed rate. So here we can see that the feed is increased to 3,792. And when we're at the maximum step over or the maximum engagement, we are at the, the standard feed and speed that we would be running. Now to understand why this is important, I have a really awesome video here that actually shows what cutting looks like. This honestly is one of my favorite, favorite videos because it really shows what's happening at the, at the metal removal process. So what we're gonna see here is there's this triangle insert. So this isn't actually a helical land mill, but it's the exact same process that's happening. So this is just something that could actually be you know, videotaped in a straight linear cut. So what we have is we have an insert that's scraping across the material and it's doing the cutting. So what do we see? At the cutting edge, we get what's called plastic deformation, which you can actually see here. You can see the material actually like plasticizing and getting soft and, and, and moving around and then it shears. So plastic, so we get plastic deformation and then the metal actually shears and is moving up along the insert. I'll hit play again. A couple things to note about this is you're gonna see on the bottom side of the tool here, you see material build up on the, on the cutting edge. And this is because the material, you're not getting like a perfect like razor, like just pure shear. You, you're getting the material that's getting plasticized and softened here. And the idea is that all of it should be shearing off and going up. But the reality is not every single piece that you cut or that you're shearing is going up. You're getting some things that are going down and around. Like you can see that area right there kind of comes down and back around the insert. Now, this is important when we talk about, I'll pause it right here. This is important when we think about chip thickness and chip load and getting the tool underneath the cut. As you see with this material at the very tip being, being softened and being plasticized, you need to get the tool completely underneath the material. And if you don't, you won't get the shearing effect. What you'll get is you'll get some material coming up and then a lot of material coming back along the, the backside of the tool or the relief of the tool. Whenever that happens where the material is coming back around and coming on the backside of the tool, the tool's not cutting. This is what we call rubbing, right? So like we know if you go, if you go too slow, you will actually get rubbing occurring where the tool is not actually, it's not deep enough in the cut to take, to get and take a bite, it's actually rubbing. So this is, this is not, rubbing is not good. So iMachining is making sure, and I'm gonna go over this in the next slide, that we are always taking a cut, that the tool is always able to get underneath of it, underneath the material and get the proper cutting. Okay, so we have a helical end mill animation. And this was this was my next thing to show. Oh, I apologize. This one gets opened up with Windows Media Player. And this is so I can play this almost frame by frame. Play this and get it to the next. Okay. So now let's take a look at a at a helical end mill cutting as opposed to that linear cut that looks like a turning cut. So the tool is coming here, it's revolving, and it is starting to make the cut here. Now what you see is the tool, let's assume it wasn't, we're, we'll ignore the fact that it's starting on the square corner here, but the tool is starting what we call from thick to thin. So thick means at the beginning of the cut, this tool is taking the thickest amount of material 
to get the tool to the then the, the the cutting edge to get underneath the material so we get that 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 uh, plastic deformation and shearing as the tool continues along its revolution so this is this is like an animation of a single revolution of the tool you can see we come to the thin portion so all the way down here the tool is you know if we remember that animation before this material is pretty soft and plasticized down here for sure even at the end of this cut this tool is probably going to get more wear because this material here it's not going to be perfectly shearing and coming off and coming out as a chip and flying away from the from the tool it's going to be rubbing back here on the back side so every time the tool is actually starting and ending a cut you are getting you're getting a little bit of wear at the back here so the main thing here we want to do is we always want to try to maximize that and I'll go around to the next revolution to show it again we want to maximize thick to thin i'll keep going through the animations one or two times so you get a good understanding we want to maximize that thickness at the beginning of the cut and go to the thin portion at the end of the cut and i'll do one more revol one more revolution so we got thick going all the way down to thin and if you notice, um, hopefully you guys can see this, this is the scallop that's left between each revolution, right? So like as this, so th this animation is truly having the tool step forward while it's revolving and doing the cut. So on the vertical wall, you will get the scallops that you'll, that you'll see. So some of the details of cutting with the helical end mill, as we talked about is, is thick to thin. Now, if we were to analyze the tool making a full slot cut, what you actually see is down here, the tool is actually starting thin, moving to thick at 90 degrees, and then coming back to thin. So this is bad here, because we know, at now watching that video with the plastic deformation, if every time this beginning cutting edge flute is hitting this thin portion right here in the bottom, it is going to not actually have it's not taking enough bite to get underneath the cut to shear away the metal so you're getting wear so it's going to take at some point and and this comes into the machine rigidity the sharpness of the tool the material you're cutting at what point during this cut is the tool going to actually reach that shearing point where the material is sheared away and it's no longer rubbing another thing that we do with eye machining is climb cutting all the time and this is important to keep a constant, not a constant um, load on the tool, but a constant directional load. So what this means is that when we're cutting here at like 90, let's say this is 80 degrees here, the, the pressure vector of the tool is pushing this way against the tool. When it's coming down to here, the pressure vector is now, you know, this direction. So we are keeping the tool in this, let's say 12 o'clock to three o'clock area of the tool. So the, in, the, the pressure on the tool is always this way. If we're doing climb cutting, if we're doing, I'm sorry, conventional to climb, the pressure vector over here is actually gonna be this way. Then it's gonna come here, which is this way, and then here, which is this way. And what you actually get is you get like an oscillation effect where the tool is actually being pushed in a varying, you know, like way where it's, it's, it's getting, flexed and pushed around and then you get everything vibrating so we don't want that to happen we want to try to keep the, the load on the tool always in kind of one quadrant or one direction so that way the tool's flexing always in the same in the same way because in the end your spindle and machine is flexing if you just take an indicator drop it on the tip of your tool when it's not cutting and just push on the tool you're going to see it moves so the, there is movement in the tool and the and the spindle and the bearings and everything. So it's important that 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 the flexion that we have is always in the same quadrant. Chip thickness and chip load are they the same? Uh, this is a pretty important thing that a lot of people some people use these terms interchangeable and they shouldn't be. So chip load is the distance that the tool travels per revolution. So at ninety degrees chip load is chip thickness. So here we see here, chip load equals chip thickness. 
when you have a when the tool is engaged less with the tool uh, with the material chip load let's say so here's this chip load here this is this is the distance between here the chip thickness which is actually the thickness of the chip which this is where we so chip thickness is what actually defines if the tool the end mill is going to be able to get a plastic deformation and shearing effect so here you see the chip thickness at 40 degrees is much less than chip load so what do we do we want to adjust the feed rate or adjust the chip load feed rate so that the chip thickness is actually the proper chip thickness so here we see at 10 degrees if we look at kind of this cross-sectional chip so this is the this is the thickness that the tool is actually going to be cutting we want this to be thick so that way the tool is getting underneath the material it's reaching plastic deformation and it's shearing away the material when we look at the chip thickness and the chip load at 80 degrees which is actually the maximum of eye machining you'll see they're very similar so with eye machining we are adjusting the feed rate so that way the chip thickness at the edge of the cutter is is correct to go along with that is you have to take into account the center of the tool versus the edge of the tool so this i like to talk about the uh, runners on a racetrack so whenever we see runners on an oval racetrack they're staggered when they start and that's because the inside of the track is the shortest linear distance and the outside lane is the longest linear distance so this means we have to do the same thing with cutting because the cnc only knows about cutting at the center of the tool so what does this mean this means when we are cutting internal corners or inter, inter, uh, internal radiuses or any shape, like it can be, you know, eye machining is going to be successive um, linear points. Anytime you are doing an arc type movement, we need to decrease the feed rate in internal corners. So that way the feed rate at the edge of the tool, because this is where the cutting actually occurs. The cutting actually occurs at the edge of the cutter. We need to slow it down. And so over here, you can see here, we're actually slowing down the, the FZ. So if we didn't, we would have this huge chip thickness, which is actually too much for the tool. And then you get into either the tool breaking or just wearing it prematurely because we're taking too much chip thickness. So internal corners, we slow down. And then on external corners, we will speed up to correct the feed rate at the edge of the tool. So both of these things, the chip thickness and adjusting the feed rate are critical. So what does an eye machining tool path look like? So what you're going to see is controlled step over. So you're always going to see, you're going to see no overloading of the tool in the corners. Everything is exact stock cutting. So you're never going to see air cutting. And all of the motions are always going to be smooth and tangent. And this is important for the CNC. This is just a simple example of what an eye machining tool path looks like in 2D for a couple of different pockets. So 3D eye machining and scallop step up. So this is what we saw in the video. And this is where we, this is where eye machining 2D and eye machining 3D split. In eye machining 2D, we're dealing with prismatic geometry. So we have basically straight walls. So we have one step down or straight step downs. With 3D, what we need to do is in the end, we have to finish the part. So we need to have a uniform material across the entire shape of it. So eye machining 3D uses a scallop definition. And basically this scallop definition defines what should be the maximum distance from the from the from the finished surface should the eye should the 3D eye machining tool path leave after the cutting. And so this uses what we call scallop cutting. And if we look here on this cross section of just this, I mean we could almost call this a prismatic, it's a prismatic pocket but with taper you can see on this vertical on this more vertical wall we have three steps or four steps and then on this shallow angled we have more steps so i machining 3d is automatically inserting additional steps so that way we get the same scallop so the distance from the finished part to this peak here is the same as it is from here to here I machining 3D also has very minimal repositioning. And this becomes, let's say, very important because even in all 3D toolpath, 
you end up with lots of movements going from one area of the model to the other area of the model because you're cleaning up corners, you're bouncing across the model. It's not just like a straight, simple pocket. You're going from area to area. So in iMachining 3D, we have a very, very optimized repositioning algorithm. So it will stay in areas and it will just keep the tool down. And this is all done with true 3D collisions between the tool, the holder, and the true updated stock. So the repositioning is, is huge. And I think for anybody who cuts 3D parts, you know that a lot of times when watching 3D cutting, the, the time spent in linking movements where the tool is not actually cutting can be very, very large. In the same with iMachining 2D, there's no air cutting even in 3D. So in 3D iMachining, we use the true updated stock, which means this, is, this means if you're going from multiple tools or you're going from multiple directions, we only cut where they're stock. And actually 3D iMachining is only based on stock. You cannot just give the tool path the target and say, oh, just put down some, some cuts on this target. It needs a stock. Now, whether that stock is a casting or just a billet block of a block that's just rectangular, it needs a stock and it only works from the stock. And then every successive tool path is using the true updated stock and you only get cutting where you need it. Now, when we talk about the tool path, we also have to talk about the wizard because this is the second main module that we have. Now, when we need to calculate feeds and speeds, we have a problem where we don't know all of the data. So if we think about all the data that we are missing, we have the material. So we need to know things like cutting speed, hardness, maximum step, minimum step. We need to know the information about the tool length, flutes, helix angles, what chip thickness the tool is capable of cutting, the hardness of the tool, what is the depth that it's currently cutting, and then the machine. So us as machinists, we are intrinsically taking in all of this information and trying to put our best guess forward and our experience on what feeds and speeds and step overs and step downs and everything should I use to get the proper cutting. iMachining, we solve this automatically with our technology wizard. So this takes out all of the guesswork that we are normally doing. And we are taking in the material, the geometry, the machine, and the tool. We calculate the true cutting parameters, and then we synchronize all of that for you. So not only is this just like a simple speed and feed wizard thing that just gives you feeds and speeds, and then you got to type it in the operation, these things are interlinked. The tool path is interlinked with the technology wizard the entire time, such that even with iMachining 3D, when we do our step up, we have different depth of cuts because we're actually, we're actually doing smaller depth of cuts. The wizard actually recalculates the feeds and speeds for the, for the different depth of cuts and gives that to the tool path. So the tool path is actually dynamically changing for each step up and each step to cut that's occurring. With iMachining Wizard, we have our fantastic option of the, of the iMachining slider. So what does the slider do? We have our cutting conditions and we make a set of one through eight. We're basically level eight is the maximum cutting force or maximum metal removal rate. And level one is the lowest cutting force and the lowest metal removal rates. And then we give an interpolation between these. So what this allows you as the end user to do is control how aggressive you wanna be. Because iMachining for all that it does, it's, it can't know everything. We can't know how strong the part is held. We can't know, um, we can't know the, the true quality of the end mill. I mean, there is a difference between there is a difference between end mills, even if they say they have the same parameters and the same helix angles and stuff. Um, so we rely on the end user to be able to adjust this. So he can adjust whether he wants a stronger cutting force or less cutting force. A major portion of why iMachining works so well with deep depth of cutting and why the cutting is so smooth is that we calculate axial contact points. And basically what axial contact points are, it's how many teeth are engaged in the material vertically for a depth of cut. 
So if we look at this end mill over here and we look at one ACP at a depth of 0 0.314 inches for a 45 degree helix angle and a half inch end mill, we, this gives us two teeth in contact when we're cutting. This is the same phenomenon that happens when we have like a shell mill and we're face cutting. As you know, if you listen to a shell mill when it's face cutting, it starts out in air and then it starts entering the cut. When it first starts entering the cut, we hear the dunk, 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 dunk of each insert starting to do the cut. Once we actually get two teeth in contact, like once you get about 50% of the tool engaged, you hear that dunk, dunk, dunk go away and then it's smooth, right? So, so we, we have this dunk, 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 dunk at the beginning of the tool path. It smooths out as it's moving across the part. And then once the tool exits the material again, we go back to that dunk, 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 dunk. And if you look at the surface finish of, of the part after you face mill it, we see that the swirls at the beginning of the tool path, we see those swirls at the beginning where the tool is entering. We see one set of swirls for the cutting all the way across. And then we see the last set of swirls when the tool exits. Ex, um, helical end mills have this same phenomenon, which if you can get multiple teeth in the cut, you add stability and you add smoothness um, to to the load of the tool. So that way the tool isn't bouncing kind of coming in and out of the coming in and out, in and out of the cut. And as I said, the tool spindle assembly is always flexing. So even though we think we got a you know a big 13 millimeter tool in there there is flex and we want to minimize that flex. So let's go over some live programming for iMachining 3D. Taking a quick drink. So here's my part here. So this is just the, let's call this a traditional 3D mold insert. You know, just, you know, we got basically flat features, we have tapered features. This is kind of what we're gonna see more or less in molds, right? Tapered surfaces, some contoured surfaces. So it's a mixture of, of let's say 2D and 3D shapes in one, in one model. So how does 3D eye machining work? We're gonna add a, add a 3D eye machining operation. We are going to select the tool we wanna cut with. So I'm gonna use this uh, 12 millimeter tool. I know that we're not cutting all the way down to the bottom, so I'm just going to kind of roughly set my lower level to be here because there's no point to have it cut deeper. And we have our technology wizard. It's already set on level eight. If I wanted to go less, I could go, I could go less, but we're going to go level eight. And I'm just going to calculate the tool path the way it is. So as of this point, I've not changed any technology parameters. I I already have our material, our machine picked. We have a Haas SS machine. Um, we have a, I think it's a, I forget what the steel is, but everything was automatically calculated for me. Step over, step downs, and here's our, here's the calculated tool path from 3DI machining. So let's go take a look at this in the simulation. I'm using the solid cam simulator in flyout mode. This way we don't see all this stuff with the with the SolidWorks model. And let's press play. So as the same we saw with the video, we see iMachining goes deep, deep step down, and then it starts working backwards up the model. And we do step up. And this is to get the model to a near net finish. So here's, here's the first roughing tool path with iMachining. We can turn on the compare stock and target, and we can kind of see here that there's a lot of there's a lot of material because we have some pretty big we have some pretty big scallops, right? So when it comes to 3D machining, and this is kind of a little different, you know, for anybody who does 3D machining, everybody's going to know this. When we come when we compare 3D to 2D, in 2D we pretty much are able to go rough and then right to finish. In 3D parts and five axis parts and everything, we have roughing, generally rest roughing, and then, sem and then semi finishing. And why is this? Because you can't just go directly from roughing 
right to finishing because the roughing tool pass, because they work, because they work with generally flat mills with radiuses, and we do step downs, you end up with scallops on the walls of the entire part. So we have to go through some sort of semi-finishing routine to try to get the part to where there's a constant, just perfect amount of material on the entire model. When we do a 2D pocket, if we do a 2D pocket and we say, hey, leave, leave 0.2 millimeters on the wall, you literally get 0.2 millimeters on the wall, except for maybe the corners if your tool is smaller. But on a 3D part, it doesn't work like that. You give it a wall offset of 0.2 millimeters, and then whatever step down you pick is leaving how much, in the end, the two, the combination of the step down plus the wall offset will leave a varying amount of material. And we need to take care of that because we just can't go right to finishing because the tool would just overload and be cutting way too much. And the finishing tools, we don't want the tool burying itself. So what can we do with 3D machining? 3D machining, we can just lower the scallop height. So if we come back to the technology page, so what do we have here? We have a wall offset of 0.4, when we lower that to 0.25. So we're gonna leave a wall offset of, and a floor offset of 0.25, but we want a scallop height of 0.45. So what does that mean? That means we're going to have 0.45 millimeter of material. That's gonna be the largest amount of material that is on any part of the model. And this is really the thing that makes eye machining 3D just a huge time savings over um, traditional roughing and semi-finished toolpath. Because this one toolpath right here is going to bring the model to a net surface finish, as we would call it. So obviously, as you can see, we got more toolpath. We can see the cycle time over here is now 13 minutes. It was um, eight minutes. So we went from eight minutes from standard step downs and scallops to 13 minutes. So we only added five minutes to this tool path. And if we go look at the simulation now, the final result of this one 3 di machining tool path the part is going to be very, very close to the net finish of the target. Zoom in a little bit. Now, what you'll also notice as a tool, now that the tool is finished cutting, so we see this, so we see the part, we see much closer to the, to the final target. I'll turn on the stock and target comparison. So now for me, as, as the programmer and ready to, to continue programming with this, I look at this tool path and go, ah, awesome. This looks great. My model is more or less finished everywhere or semi-finished everywhere outside of just excess uh, the corners where the larger tool couldn't fit in. Now, if we turn that off, let's look at a couple things here. As I said, I'm machining 3D uses intelligent scallop. So what does that mean? It means we put a localized step up distance based on the curvature or the, um, the angle of the surface. So on this near vertical taper, look how big this, the step down is. I mean, if I click on this line, we have 3.6 millimeters. So 3.6 millimeters is this step down. If I come over to this shape, this portion of the model, let me zoom in so I can pick on an edge. We have 0 0.45 millimeters. If I zoom in some more, yeah, let's look at, so that we have a distance from this flat to this flat, 0 0.09 millimeters. And as we look on the model, you'll see there's different step, there's different step heights everywhere because the model has 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 a different vertical taper to it entirely in every spot it's it's a different taper. So as we see here with iMachining 3D, it adapted the tool path from anywhere between let's say 0.1 millimeters to 
almost four millimeters here. And as you saw, it only increased the cycle time. And this is important here. The cycle time only went from eight minutes to 13 minutes to get to this near net finish. Now, what do we do with traditional tool pass if we don't have something like eye machining? Well, we need to we need to get this same result, right? So we're gonna try this little, we're gonna try this and, and see what we what we get and what happens. So let's say we know we need to, we need a finalized step or a finalized tool path before finishing that will leave 0.25 wall offset and leave us with a scallop height of roughly a half a millimeter before we go into finishing. So this means we need, let's say, a constancy tool path. And what we need is we need a step down of we can't pick we can't pick the three and a half millimeter because we do three and a half millimeter, we're gonna have huge scallops everywhere. Let's say to be perfect, we need to go almost all the way down to this 0 0.1 millimeter, but that's let's call that a little um that's way too many steps. So we want to pick some step down in between 0 0.1 and like, I don't know, let's say what's some of these normal size scallops here. These normal size scallops are kind of, let's go from this surface to this surface, 0 0.5. So let's, let's pick like 0 0.35 for a step down. So what we're going to do, we're going to suppress our eye machining operation. I'm going to, I'm gonna go backwards so that way we can understand why in 3D we have to do all that we do. So we're gonna go and add a constancy toolpath. So this is gonna be like our semi-finished toolpath. I'm gonna go grab our 12 millimeter end mill. I am going to set my wall offset to 0 0.25, same for the floor. And now our step down, we said we wanna use like 0 0.35. So we're just kind of roughing somewhere between what the 3DI machining did. Um, we want to set some feeds and speeds. I am going to do things that are not really practical. I'm going to use the same feed and speed that we're using in eye machining, but that really isn't practical because the tool will definitely not take those types of cutting, but I think it was 4,500 um, millimeters per minute. Link down, we'll use the same, and link up, we'll use the same. And let's calculate this tool path. So what I'm calculating now is the is the is a final tool path that would get us to an end result of what the eye machining tool path does. Now this tool path is not roughing, so there's going to be over engagement everywhere, and there's going to be chunks of material. So we're going to have to add some roughing tool path. But let's just take a look and see and see what we get. So here we got our constancy tool pass. This is 11 minutes. Okay. So just 11 minutes just to add these constancy tool paths. Let's just go into the simulation real quick. We're gonna see all sorts of collisions and stuff like that, but, and I'll just play it as fast as we can. But what we wanna see is that that 0 0.35 step down is, is, is the required step down to get, let's say a near net finish with a constant with a constant Z tool path. Now, as I said, that, did, that didn't do any roughing. So the tool is just, there's collision warnings everywhere. It's gouging, or not gouging, it's colliding with the stock. It makes perfect sense. This is, a, this is a finishing routine. It's not a roughing routine. So we got this tool path. Let's say this is good. We're happy with this for semi, for semi finishing, but now we need to add some roughing tool path back to this thing. So I'm gonna add a 3D, HSR operation. Let's do contour roughing. Now, generally with generally with steel and 3D parts, most people are not using carbide end mills to do the roughing of their 3D parts. Most people with steel and stuff are going to use like high feed inserts. So something like something like this tool. It's a 30 millimeter end mill. And it's going to have, um, you know, a shallow depth of cuts. And this is this is made for doing shallow depth of cuts and high feed cutting. So we're going to take this 30 millimeter tool. Um, let's pick some, let's say like uh, 4,500 RPMs, high feed cutting. I don't know, maybe, I mean, probably probably 4,000 millimeters per minute is 
probably pretty good. We'll pick the same for the link up and link down. Uh, do, 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 do. Um, edit passes, don't need that. Step down, uh, let's see, wall offset. We're gonna leave the same 0 0.25 because that's what we're trying to do. Step down of one millimeter for high feed mill. I think that's pretty, I think that's pretty, pretty good. Now, one of the positives that you do get with using high feed style cutting is you use a shallower depth of cut. So as you see, we're generally going to be cutting with a smaller step down than what you do with 3DI machining, so, which makes you think like, wow, this is awesome. Like I'm actually going to remove more material and save similar cycle times. So we can look over here, we can see 11 minutes for the roughing tool path, and we can see that that eye machining tool path was 13 minutes. So you first look at this and go, wow, this, 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 for maybe just the one pure roughing tool path, like it's actually, man, it may, it, it might be the same speed or even faster than 3D eye machining. But if we go to the simulation and let's play this, I'll slow it down. These high feed, these high feed cutters are generally larger and these high feed cutters are going to leave extra material. And then we have to come back with smaller tools to try and bring the material down to a net finish. So let's take a, let's turn on the stock and target comparison. And what do we see? So this larger tool, it did remove a good bulk of material pretty quickly. So that the, the bulk material removal is, it's pretty impressive with high feed cutters. Um, but now we come into, well, what do we do with all the material that's in, that's in all the corners? down in these areas, because when it comes to 3D shapes, you get lots of areas where large tools can't, can't fit into. So if we look at this end result of this roughing tool path, we're not gonna be able to go directly from the roughing right to that HSM tool path to our near net finish. So what that means is we also now need to add a, let's call it a rest roughing. And now what we're going to do is we're going to pick we're going to pick the roughing 12 millimeter tool that we had. Um, let's go back. Um, once again, I'm being very, 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 very nice to the tool path because I'm using the same feeds and speeds as eye machining, which is is not going to work in real life. But we're going to be nicer than we normally are. Uh, one millimeter step down. Uh, yep. I mean, maybe I could go even a little bit more, but let's stick with the same thing as the roughing. So this rest roughing routine is gonna use the updated stock. It is going to now add cutting in all the areas that the larger tool could not get into. Now, like I said, this is not eye machining. So like all these areas where it's coming full slot material, even though we are doing a one millimeter step down, it's really gonna beat up on the, on, on the tool pretty bad. So what do we got? We now got like four minutes for, for this tool path. So let's, let's simulate all three of these together. So we're gonna have now, we have our roughing, our rest roughing with the smaller size tool and then, and then our semi-finish. Now all this time I'm, I'm analyzing like the result of the of each tool path and then going back and adding more tool path or picking a different size tool to try and manage it like and i'm having to look at the 3d i'm having to look at this 3d cutting and say okay where is there leftover material is the semi-finished tool going to be able to just do what it needs to do is it going to you know i mean i already know looking in here like look right here this 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 last semi finished tool path is probably going to plow right through this material. I, I already know that that's the tool's not going to like it. Is it going to is is this twelve millimeter tool going to cut? Probably. But I mean, the more it gets in here, the more it engages, the more squealing you're going to get, and you're gonna you're gonna wear that cutter. And I'll uh. bring this to the end. So now we see all three of those tool paths were required 
to bring this model to the same result of what one single iMachining 3D toolpath did. And what you notice is there's so many more step downs and cutting that is completely unnecessary. We are we are dependent upon the technology that we have and the tools that we have. So we had to pick that step down to get the final result, but that was a lot more extra tool path than what we need with 3D I machining. And so here we see the combination, you know, when we add up all these tool paths, you know, 11 minutes, 11 minutes, and five minutes, that is still like three times as long as the I machining tool path. And like I said, I can tell you, I these feeds and speeds that I'm picking are definitely not justifiable for, for what we were doing. And this is so and this is where 3D eye machining customers really see a huge difference. They will replace with one eye machining operation many operations in in their cam part. And the other thing it leads is you get much better tool life, and the part is much easier on the finishing tool paths and and this is something where a lot of people will use lots of pencil milling tool paths and corner roughing and corner semi finish tool paths to try to get out all that material so when they get to the finishing it's not over engaging with 3d i machining it's taking care of that automatically for you and the last thing i want to show because with 3d i machining we talk about 3d i machining for not just contoured parts but also prismatic parts and what's really awesome about 3d i machining for prismatic parts is that same scallop that definition that we use it automatically finds all the flat areas in a prismatic part so one 3d toolpath from i machining let me slow that down one 3d toolpath from i machining will find all of the levels in your multi-pocketed part and machine all of it in one single operation. So that scallop definition is also working for prismatic. And this is where, so even if you're just a prismatic machining, you know, uh, customer and you're not doing molds and 3D shapes, 3D I machining gives you a single one-click one-click tool path to do the complete roughing of your entire part. And then after that, you can go in with all of our feature recognition stuff to finish the walls and floors. You can also use HSMs, floors and walls, if you like, you know, if your parts, if your parts simple enough, you can use those, the, the, the automated tools in 3D HSM to do floor and wall finishing. Or if you need a little bit more finesse, you can use the 3D I machining feature recognition. All right, let's go back to the presentation. The eye machining challenge. I mean, I went over this in the, in, in the 2D webinar, but basically what I'm telling every customer and every reseller and everybody is, if you've never cut with eye machining, you got to make the first cut. It truly is a it's like a life-changing experience the first time you cut with eye machining and you hear it on the machine and you see what happens. It's 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 one of them things that you can watch it in videos and and sometimes I feel like when you see the videos on YouTube, you watch our videos and you're like, "Wow, those guys are cutting so fast. It's it's chips are flying everywhere. Like I'm not looking to to do that style cutting. Like they're probably spending all this money and time and optimizations to get those crazy cuts." The reality is we don't. I machining just works and you just get those style cuts, but you can just start, make a simple cut. And, and this example is just go find a block of material. I'm not gonna go over the steps here. Find a block of material, go to MetWeb and, and insert the, and find the ultimate tensile strength. Go grab a three to five flute carbide end mill in your shop. You wanna use, Use your digital calipers to, or your calipers to measure one axial contact point. Make a pocket, just a simple open pocket like this, because this way you can see the cutting happening. There's no helical entry. You usually have good coolant flush. You can really see what's going on. And then just program a 2D machining pocket with level six. 
and then go cut it on the machine. It truly is life changing. And then what's fun, and I'm telling you, every single person runs into this, the cut's going to work at level six. And then the next question everybody has is, how do we go faster? And this is fun. And this is what you want to do. So you can, you can, if you have extra blocks of aluminum or extra blocks of the, the material, hopefully you can just rotate the part. Maybe you can cut on the backside here. If the part was thick enough, maybe you get four cuts out of a block because you can, you know, flip it um, on the bottom side too. Switch to level eight, activate turbo mode in the advanced cutting conditions, or you can also adjust the machinability factor. I'm sure everybody here registered for the 2D webinar. So if you didn't watch the 2D webinar, I do go over this a little bit more, um, a little more deeply. I actually show creating it and how to do that. But um, if anybody has any questions, call your you call your reseller and just ask for some some quick help to do this. It's this experiment will take nothing more than an hour or two of your time, and it will be life changing for you in your shop. I'm going to end it with our comparisons to other tool paths. So a lot of people try to say, oh, we have an eye machining. And the reality is other people don't have an eye machining. All of these competitors try to act like they have an eye machining, but they don't. When we look at all the things that eye machining has, we are different than all of them. We vary the cutting angle. We have feed adjustments. We have morphing spirals, we handle thin parts, and all of these things, we have our technology wizard. Our learning curve is short, shortest cycle time. We also do complete rough rest and finishing, and we have first part success. The, the, the cutting portion of what iMachining does with the feed adjustments and the cutting angles is, is critical. This is what allows our customers to cut with the smallest tools and the hardest material. I mean, I have, we have customers that cut with one, like I've had customers send me videos with like 0.15 millimeter end mills cutting in steel. You can't even hear it cutting. You just, I mean, as they, they're, they're like, we, we wanted to see if this could happen. We were using a wire EDM for doing this cutting in steel. We programmed it with eye machining. You couldn't see or hear anything that was cutting, but after it got done, the tool was still there and it cut. The things that we do to control the, the tip of the end mill at that, at that point where it's trying to do the plastic deformation and shearing, what we do in everything in the tool path is for that specific spot to make the cutting work be the best that it can be. Nobody else is doing that. And then you, then you add all the technology wizard and everything that we have, it, it is unmatched. Everything else is left up to you to figure out. With iMachining, we've, we've wrapped it all up in a, in, in a nice kit. And then the last thing I will end with is our friend Greg Burns, because he says, as a customer, better than what I can say. My hopes is that not too many people learn about iMachining because it is my biggest um, competitive edge. So as Greg says, eye machining is his best competitive edge. And like I said in the beginning of the webinar, eye machining is like having extra CNCs in your shop. You, you will, it is, it is easier and simpler to go buy it, to, to, to have the solid cam eye machining module than it is to go get another end, to go get another CNC and everything involved with that. Um, so thank, thank you everybody for joining the webinar. Um, if anybody has any questions, I will take them now. Let's see. Hold on. I need to pop this out so I can see. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, how? Okay. One question is, how much spindle load is good for the CNC? 
Um, so what's good for the CNC? I would say I would say less than fifty percent. I mean it. It depends what you know what 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 your what your machine is and what type of wear you're looking. I mean I know customers that are in the end they they don't mind if their spindles need to be replaced every three years. Um, and then there's other customers of ours, which um, even in iMachining, we have a, you can define that iMachining uses less RPM than the maximum of the machine, because even though your, your spindle has a 24,000 RPM spindle, that doesn't mean you want to always be cutting at 24,000 RPMs. So what we see is a lot of customers will, you know, lower their maximum RPM to like 80% of the total of the, of the spindle. Um, so spindle loads, I mean, I would say, I would say probably in the 10, 10 to 30% range is really, I think a good maximizing life of the spindle. Um, but I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these high end machines like Makinos and stuff like that, man, they, they put so much technology into their spindles and they want you running them things high load all the time. So um, you kind of got to, Use your judgment a little bit upon your machine and and, and see what you want to do. Uh, uh, what ACP values are good um, in iMachining in the ACPs we will give you. And uh, let's see, I will go to share my screen. When you have the Technology Wizard open, we give you um, the ACPs and we give you this coloring here of red, yellow, and green. Green is the best, yellow is hmm, and red is bad. So in the end, the main thing you need is at least one ACP and um, anything, anything over one ACP will give you either green or yellow. The closer you are to a solid whole number, the better. So um, and that's that that's basically what you wanna what you wanna aim for is the closest to a whole number as possible. Obviously, as we saw with 3D I machining, 3D I machining is picking step ups all the way along the entire part. So you're getting very variable depth of cuts the entire time. Um, there is an option to also limit the depth of cut to one ACP in 3D I machining. So if you do have a material that's really hard and um, and you don't want to, if you, you know you get vibration at less than one ACP. You can limit the depth of the depth to one ACP. And is there finishing pass in 3D I machining? No, unfortunately, there is no finishing passes in 3D I machining. So I machining is just for 2D roughing and rest roughing. And then you would use um, generally you're gonna if it's a prismatic part, you're gonna use I machining 2D with the feature recognition, and there you have compensation and everything else that you need um, and, or else you would use 3D, 3D HSR or um, Turbo HS or HSM, one of the one of those technologies to finish to finish your part. Okay, well that is that's all the questions we have. So once again, thank you everybody for joining the webinar. Um, I hope it was helpful and for any resellers, we will um, we will be sending out the parts and videos that I used on the presentation. Thanks, have a good day, bye.